Our winters are long in Montana, so we come up with different. And then always you got that dog with his tail caught in the door. Little Fluffy runs outside. The dog gets caught in the door. It sounds like this. All right, that's enough of that. But we love calling animals in, and it's uh, fun to do. What else can we do? We could do uh, ducks and geese. I know we got some duck decoys here. There's nothing better than hunting waterfowl. You get those green heads flying, and all of a sudden you get the geese going. They start cupping in, and what do we say? Take them. Why? Because we're shopping at God's grocery store. <laughs> That's the fast food section right there. All right, we're going to keep going. I appreciate you being here. I'm going to have fun tonight. I, I love talking, hunting, and fishing. I can't wait to hear some of your stories. I've been talking to some of these guys earlier about some of their turkey hunting, and they're fired up about the season, you season with this weekend. You got the other seasons opening this week in Tennessee, so you need to get out there and enjoy it. We might even share one of Marsha's turkey recipes here in a little bit. Hunting whitetail deer. We know we got a lot of whitetail hunters in here. Here's a couple things that'll help you pay attention to the deer and how they're acting as the season progresses. Some bucks will start mirroring does early. What do you mean by that? They'll start hanging with them. So often people go, oh, here's the season days. Here's what I'm gonna hunt. I tell people, hunt as much as you can during the seasons. That's the best way to increase your odds. What I found is the more I hunt, the luckier I get. It's amazing how that, that works out when you're out there in the woods. So say, Chad, how many days a year will you hunt? Oh, 120 to 150. So that is a great way to get out in the outdoors. Now, I know you all can't do that, but I will tell you, the more you, time you spend in the woods, the, the better you're going to be. And always be ready to expect a good deer in your area. Now, you put trail cams out. You do your scouting, and you're like, oh, yeah, they're in here. How many have ever had a deer show up that you never knew was in that area? Oh yeah, they'll pop up. It's like, oh, I got this figured out. And then you go, where did that one come from? In fact, I'm gonna show you some footage of my son Walker this year. He got engaged, getting ready to get married. He's like, dad, I wanna take Brienne on a hunt with us. I'm like, great, she's never hunted out west. I'm like, all right, let's do it. He's like. I'm cool with just a management deer. I just want to shoot a, a mule deer out there. And I'm like, all right. He said, I'm not going to shoot a whitetail unless it's really big. He's taking good whitetails all over, and he's taking good mule deer. And he's like, I'm going to be a little picky. Well, we're glassing. And I knew this area. I knew what bucks were in that. I've been watching it all summer and early fall. And all of a sudden, we pull the binos up, and I'm like, look at that muley. That's not a muley, that's a whitetail. When a whitetail fool, fools you for a mule deer, let's just watch the footage. It's a cold, clear day here in Montana. We've been out deer hunting this morning, looking for a management <coughs> mule deer. We just came around the corner and saw a massive whitetail. He went down to this bottom and kind of started swimming on top on this edge. I see these pops out, so I think there's some does with him across your path. Walker's using a CVA Cascade 300 wind mag. I don't, He's going to get a chance on this deer, but I'm going to sh leave the footage so you can see how excited he really was. This is a giant deer. About 285 yards. He hammered him. No, I did not just shoot that deer. Is he dead, Dad? Can I shoot him again? Are you sure he's dead? <laughs> he's lost him. I really want to shoot him again. Yeah. I, I did not just shoot that one. Yes, you did. Walker knew how big this deer was. What do you like? That was her first deer hunt. 14 points, 170 inch deer. Walker knew what that buck was. That's why he was so excited. The thing is, he said, okay, Bree, you have to go on every hunt with me now. 
I've never shot a whitetail that big, and you were here with me, so you got to go with me. So <clears throat> get the family out there in the outdoors. Enjoy that time together. And if you don't get excited like that on a deer that size, quit hunting. I mean, you should be getting excited out there. Now, we've got a lot of first-time hunters, and I go over some of the basic stuff in these seminars, but make sure you understand shot placement. you got these young people out here hunting. Talk to them about the angles of when should you do that before season. Not while you're sitting in a tree stand saying, okay, that deer's going, aim, aim behind the light. No. Get pictures. Go over angles with them. Hopefully you get that perfect broadside shot and you go, yeah, that's perfect, line it up there. But what happens when they're coming at you? You've got to look where the leg is on the far side. Look where that direction the bullet's going to go and pay attention to everything around you. And look, now the other thing to do is, it's always about hunter safety and be sure of your target and beyond. You see that picture right there in the middle, you can see something in the background that looks like another deer. So look which way that bullet's going to travel, make sure you have a clear shot. The other thing is, what about when they're walking away? Because sometimes those deer are walking away from you and make sure, okay, I got to cheat that back a little ways so I can get that perfect ethical shot. You don't want to have to trail them. You want to get that. Why? Because venison's delicious. We just came through a crazy time in America and pandemic, and there was a million first-time hunters this last year. A million. You know what? The, I, I'll just tell you, I do um, marketing with CVA muzzleloaders and, and Bergara and all their media relations for them. We did some research. You know what we found? Number one search on Google about hunting was this. How do I hunt? Why? Because people were going to the grocery stores and they could only buy one pack of meat. They're like, we got to get serious about this. We got to do it. <laughs> That's also when you say, man, we can't find ammo anywhere. There were 7 million first time gun owners. 7 million. And I will tell you, I'm glad we live in a country where we have the Second Amendment because you know what's going on in Ukraine right now. What are the people using? Their own guns to protect themselves. Keep that in mind. This is a, we love our Second Amendment here in America. Elk hunting, I love elk hunting. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to give you a little sample of rifle elk hunting in Montana. Now, this white stuff I'm going to show you is snow. I know you don't get a lot of it down here. You did get some here about a week ago, I heard. But I will tell you, it's cold. It's steep. It's about five degrees when we're going after this bull. I'm uh, using a 300 wind mag and uh, know the ballistics on it. Let's see what happens. That's our sandy beaches right there. We'd spotted this bull. I, I'd been after him since bow season. That's ice on my face. So this bull's bedded in with the cows. I had to wait for those cows to clear out and get in on him. That's about two and a half feet of snow we're crawling through. Got my mittens on. 560 yards. Boom. This was a good bull, and it was a tough hunt. I'd seen this bull during bow season, tried to get on him. Our season in Montana runs for five weeks of archery, five weeks of rifle, and this was the second week of November, and you don't give up. You just keep going. He gave me the slip once, and we just kept watching and glassing, and I tell you, it's like turkey hunting. I know some of you guys are scouting birds, and if they give you a slip, don't give up. Just try a different angle and you can have success that way. Now, people ask me all the time what's new from CVA. There's a new Paramount HCR long range muzzleloader and also we came out with a new center of a fire called the Cascade SB. It means short barrel. You can take and adjust the stock on that, that center fire on the bottom, make it an inch shorter. It's great for youth and ladies and uh, 
even smaller frame guys. It's just a, a great compact little gun. And then Bergara came out with the new MG Light this year and the Divide carbon fiber barrels that are amazing. That gun on top is a chassis gun. It has a magnesium composite stock. That magnesium stock in the gun with the carbon barrel weighs six and a half pounds. That is lightweight if you're gonna do some packing uh, for sure. Turkey season's here. How do you make those turkey sounds? Now, I love using mouth calls. I have some of them on the table that we sell at these events for $5 because I like people to get involved in calling and call birds in. These are hands-free. That's what I like about them. If I can be on that bird. Now, what am I saying? When I'm calling, I'm saying chook, 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 and chick, chick, chick. If I get a little later in the day, I'm cutting, I'm trying to fire them up, I'll get a little more aggressive with them. But I don't start like that first thing in the morning. I start with that later if I'm what I call run and gun, hitting those ridges, calling, trying to fire them up. Once you get one located, then you have to be a little more patient. Now, hunting some eastern birds even have to be more <laughs> more patient with them. I'll pull out a slate call too. People ask all the time, how do you properly use these calls? And that's part of these events is trying to help people with that. Make sure you hold it the right way. If you hold it like this, that creates a sound chamber there to amplify that sound. How do I make the sound? Now, I don't take this call and go. No, I put put my palm right here, hold it between my thumb and my middle finger, and I make an oval sounds because this will make It'll make a call going down, but if I drag it back up, it doesn't. So you, and I, if I want to quiet it down, which I do a lot, I'll take my index finger and I'll hold it like this so I can quiet down. I will call in more birds doing this right here than any other call. People are like, oh, man, I can't hear it. Hey, if a bird hears that and he gobbles at it, let him come look for you. So often you get a bird fired up and then you'll call, he'll call, you'll call, and then he shuts up and he just struts back and forth at 100 yards. Make him come find you. How do you purr with this call? Choke up on it like a pencil, drag down. You want to do a little cluck or a putt? What about a fight and purr? You can go back and forth with it in a V. Try these calls, but practice prior to the season. Don't pick it up while you're in the field and go, man, I wonder what this is going to sound like. Practice before you get there. And if you're out there scouting this week, I, I promise you, use locator calls, like a crow call, like an owl call. Don't go out and be on your four-wheeler hitting some of these roads and going... Don't hear anything, drive 50 yards, 100 yards, call again. No, use locator calls when you're doing that instead of calling with this. You'll have more success that way. And uh, why do you do that? So you're not educating the birds. This time of year, go out and listen. If you get out there at sunrise or right before dark, listen, try to roost those birds, see where they're at. Pattern your shotgun. Finding ammo right now is very difficult uh, to do, so make sure you have your ammo. If you can't find the ammo you want, but you find some ammo, try different chokes in it and uh, see what it'll do. And again, always call softly to start. Well, tonight we've got my favorite hunting partner with me. Marcia, I'm going to see if she'll come up. The allergies in Tennessee are getting to this young lady here. Um, Thank you. How are you? Good. Let me grab a mic. This yellow one work? Watch out, I don't want you to trip over. Trip me? Yeah. Hey, my friend Mary was here and she asked a good question. Okay. She was talking about that elk. And she said, how do you get it all out? That's a very good question. That's what I have you for, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people say, what do you do with all of that meat? Because Chad and I both hunt. We have Walker and Wyatt and now our daughter-in-law, and I'm like, what do you do with all that meat? We eat it. 
Yeah. It's delicious. Well, yes, we do eat it and we process it. Oh, turkeys. We got, we got turkey hunters here. We got to tell them something. In the pandemic, we caught, came off the road a little bit from doing seminars. Yep. I feel like you went, like I can't hear you. Can you all hear him good? Okay. There, is that a little bit better? There we go. All right. You're, you're, you're getting excited thinking about turkeys already I know. fixing them. I know. Now, we're hunting deer now. If we throw them on the pit moss like that, Ooh. that's a little loud. They're good. But on the turkeys, what's our new we've recipe? Got, we've got a new recipe. So, and a friend of ours who has a restaurant, and he uses this a lot for fish, and we thought, man, we should try this on our turkeys. So we get a tempura batter. And the secret with tempura batter is a lot of times is that you use really cold ice water with the tempura batter. He's like, write this down. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So yeah, I, I saw, yeah, write this down. So you use really cold ice water. Well, the friend of ours said use really cold ice club soda instead of the water with the tempura batter. I'm like, I don't think that's going to make that big a difference. It is a game changer. It is really, really good. It's, it's lighter. Phenomenal. It's crispier. What you do is flay those breasts out, cut them in strips about like this, about that thick, but then take a meat tenderizer hammer, the mallet, pound them down. That way there's no shot in them. Or you can use a plate and do that to break that meat up. Oh, put some seasoning on it. And oh, that is so good. Now, I, Marcia. I, I make an almond gravy. That's Kind of like how you get. Um, or like a chicken, uh, chicken almond, almond chicken. gravy or almond chicken, yeah. So I make an almond gravy to go with it or sweet and sour sauce, and it's really good. It is so good. You make these people hungry. Oh, yeah. Well, they're yeah. going to get to eat here in yeah. a few minutes. Yeah. They're like, hurry up, Chad. We're hungry now. But taking care of the meat, when she asked about that elk, that's a very good question. It is very important, especially we love seeing new people involved in the outdoors, whether it be a younger generation or maybe even, like you said, first-time hunters for the first time. But teaching and learning how to take care of that meat and not letting it go to waste and using that meat is very important for a good sportsman. But for that elk, we actually, it took us about four or five hours to get that elk out. We used the snow to our advantage and we kind of got on it and pushed oh, and pulled horrible. to get it up and down to a little flat. Then we got a big, huge sled like that you'd kind of use pull, like pulling it. In Montana, we use it during calving season to even get the calves out of the snow it's like a big huge sled we put the whole elk rolled it into the sled and pushed it and pulled it all the way down to a flat and then i got a snowmobile and then we had to pull pulled it, it out a, from there through a little bottom and a, yeah so it, it does take time but taking care of the meat that the lord's given you and you harvest is very important and many times we share our meat um, maybe it's sometimes when you go hunting you have more meat than you could use we challenge you as outdoorsmen to share that meat there's a lot of times um, every year, the week before Thanksgiving, our family, ever since our boys were real little, we would take meat that we had and take it to families that could use the meat. Maybe they had larger families or just having a hard time. It would be a blessing to them. And then also there's widows where their husbands used to hunt, and their, their husbands aren't there to hunt, with, to hunt with. They don't have the venison or the wild game, so we take some meat to them. So those are good things to do as being a good sportsman and to teach that next generation what to do with that with that meat absolutely and sometimes you have the snow you can do that but a lot of times we have to quarter them out mm -hmm. or bone them out and put them on our pack and it's two like guys said, two to three I'm trips that, that's what i'm there for yeah yeah marsh's got a good back mm -hmm. so young people if you're getting, looking to get married make sure you get a wife with a good back and help pack <laughs> elk out right is that what i'm hearing you carry an elk out? <laughs> <laughs> all right so it's turkey season. I know you're as fired up about turkey hunting as I am. We're going to go way back. I pulled some footage because this was award-winning footage, and there's some practical things about this that these Pastor, people need to know. Do you see that little grin on his face? Y'all don't really know him that much, but that little grin is because he's getting ready to tell a story that you're going to enjoy at my expense. Well, Marcia's I have a feeling I know what turkey story you're pulling out way back. Oh, I went way back to your first turkey story. Way back. Uh, turkey hunting. See, there it is again right there. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, look, look, I went in that earlier slide, and you, you've taken huge elk, mule deer, moose, alligators, antelope, white tails. So you're saying all that stuff to be nice because they're going to enjoy the story at my expense. Well, we were hunting South Carolina. South Carolina, my first turkey. First turkeys. We went down, and our buddies were down there and said, hey, we got a spot for you to take Marsha. That's right. And I said, man, they said, we've got a big gobbler. It's been coming out every morning. We're not going to let anybody hunt till you get here. 
I'm like, that sounds great, let's go. I said, well, Chad's gonna run camera, and he's there, so that's fine, we've got two chairs in the blind. We put a special one in there, because when they come to Montana, I take care of cooking and making their meals while they were in hunting camps, and said, man, you took such good care of us, we wanna just return the hospitality. Return the hospitality, they don't realize I guided them, they shot big mule deer, big antelope, elk, but you fed them, I guess so. so. I guess yeah. so. So what kind of chair did they put so in there they, for So they opened up the blind. It's when you go out turkey hunting, it's dark at four in the morning. If y'all have not been up at four in the morning, it's still dark. So I had this little headlight on. So I turned on my headlight. I unzip the blind. I go to step in, and it's like this big shining light was shining on my chair, like a dun dun dun. There's my chair. It was so awesome, y'all. It had leather like this thick on the seat came all the way up. It was like a big executive chair that they no, just no, took no, the no. wheels off of. It was like the Supreme Court justice oh, chairs. No. It was not, like, I, I wondered how they even got it in the blind. It's about as big as the blind was. I mean, it had the massagers it in it. It had the a massager. It did have one of those little levers though. Like I would like, Chad, don't worry about me. I'm okay over here. You know, I'm just like going up and down. I'm getting comfortable. But Aim you had a shotgun. Chair. Oh, you had I'm, a chair? I'm a half inch too high. They had you oh, all I'm a half in inch, Oh, a quarter inch too low. Let me raise it up. I was getting ready. I was getting yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah. They gave me a three-legged stool with a bent leg. So all morning, I'm sitting there just trying to... But I, I let you know I was comfortable, so you didn't yeah, worry about me. Yeah, I could hear you were comfortable. <laughs> so we got in there early. It's my first turkey hunt ever. Chad's like, now wait. There's two things I want you to do. He said, wait till the turkey lifts his head. So you have better shot opportunity. If he's strutting. There you go. Yep. If he's strutting, wait till he lifts his head. And then two, as soon as you shoot, get out and go right to the turkey. Because apparently they wear Kevlar vests sometimes. Some of them do. And, you know, they're they, tough. They escape. So yep. those were my two number one rules. Should we just roll this footage? I think you should just footage? roll the wonderful you have, the footage. How about there I not? Go. There we go. Here we go. So here we are, it, we had gotten in there, like I said, 4, 4.30 in the morning. It's about 9, 9.30. We had sat there for five hours with nothing. This was gonna be the greatest turkey hunt of my life and I never heard a turkey, never saw a turkey, nothing. And that hen did not like the decoy. She came in. Do you all see what's in behind her though? Did somebody already pick that up back there? Yes. Those turkey hunters in. Yeah, they yeah. did. So this hen came in to this decoy. While we're sitting there for five hours waiting, Chad explained to me about this stuff or decoy, and I was not familiar with it. So he's like, no, this is a hen that we've gotten. Somebody shot. They take the taxidermy. They put it out there. It's a phenomenal turkey decoy. I'm like, okay, that's great. He's like, yeah, they're kind of expensive. I'm like, how much does that cost? He's like, oh, they're two, three hundred dollars. I said, two or three hundred dollars. That was back then. I know. Now I'm they're like, four or five hundred. I buy a lot of shoes for two or three hundred dollars. I'm just saying. So this hen comes in, and she starts not happy that this other hen is there and I'm thinking I'm gonna have to paint and touch up this decoy and fix it and do y'all see that big turkey where I'm sitting in the blind that brush is 35 yards and that beard is dragging on the ground it's a big old gobbler but down. Chad's running camera when Chad runs camera he likes to make the turkey be a movie star okay so he's gonna get lots of footage while you are waiting how many of y'all would have shot that turkey right there by now I know y'all would have shot that turkey yeah, but he's like, just wait, Marsha, just wait. I'm getting great footage. He's strutting. So I'm thinking in my head, okay, this is what we're going to do. That bird's coming in. I'll do a couple yelps. He'll gobble, and when he gobbles, you shoot him. That's what's going on in my head. That's what you thought was going to happen. But he, he's, I mean, he's in like 15 yards now. More. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. I'm having a great time videoing. The way I'm sitting, he's to my right, and he's about, I'm, he's about out of my range. And that hen's wham. That's the corner of my blind right there. And I keep saying, I'm ready, I'm ready. And I keep saying, wait for it. So you're gonna make a call. Yep, I'm gonna call and he's gonna gobble. That's what the plan, look at that beard just dragging there. Let, he doesn't gobble. He doesn't read my script. No. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, cut to it. When I cut, He'll gobble. Yeah, he didn't get that memo either. Nope. It's gonna be self-defense in a minute because he's gonna be in the blind with me because he is so close. So I said, all right, I'm gonna cluck. <coughs> Warning sound. He'll lift his head. The hen did, not Mr. Gobbler. He still has not, I mean, he's completely tight-lipped, super glued, nothing. At this point, Chad was a little worried because that hen took off Poo! running. 
And I think he's going to follow her. So now I'm like, forget rule number one. I'm not waiting for him. I am just going to shoot the turkey. I have waited long enough. Now, I need you to do one thing. She is going to shoot this bird. But you need to be real quiet to hear what happens after she shoots. And I'm worried I'm going to shoot the decoy now, too, because he's so close to the decoy. Listen. Chad, I can't get up. Remember that chair, that swivel and recline? When that 12 gauge three and a half went off, boom, it launched her on her back and she's like a turtle on his back, can't get up. That chair was so big, it is hard to get out of a chair like that with my shotgun and I'd waited for so long, but Chad did what every good husband would do. He looked down, he saw no blood, so he stepped right out of, over me and went right to the turkey. The turkey was clearly not going anywhere. But yeah, it was, we, we had a good time. I, I finally roll out of the chair, lay my shotgun into a safe position, you know, and get out, crawl out of the blind, and I am, I'm coming all out like I've been through Her the, hair's through the fire. Her hat's right, yeah. And I'm coming out, and he is crying. He is, he's down by the turkey, he's crying, he's laughing so hard. I start laughing, because he's laughing. I mean, we're just having a big time. He's like, Marsha, that was some good footage. And I'm like, well, you made me wait forever. He said, but the only thing is, we only had one camera. You got to go back in the blind so I can get you shooting the gun and flipping out. I've said, oh, no, 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 no. We will not video that. So you're hearing the true story, but it's, it, there's no video of that. There isn't. You we, tried. I, I did try. I tried so hard. But you know, that's the way it is. Now, coming together as a family, we've been doing that with our boys for years. A lot of young people in here tonight, hearing protection is very important. And I will tell you, because I guided for years and I get muzzle blasted by like yeah. So a lot of times people would shoot. He'd be like, tell me when you're getting ready to, and they'd shoot. So he has a lot of hearing loss because of that. Also, when our boys were real young, we'd always want to make sure that we had hearing protection on for them so that they're here, they're be able to keep their hearing well, and it was a good thing. But so often you cannot hear when you're communicating. So if you're out turkey hunting or deer hunting, what generally happens is you're whispering to who you're with, and you're like, big buck, big buck, you know, and you're telling him he's coming in. And, and you've got a first time hunter or a youth or a young hunter, and they're like, what? Where? What'd you say? Where? You know, it never fails. Even if they try to whisper, they're not really whispering. It's a loud whisper. But having that communication is very important. We use the hearing protection whenever we have our shooting school in Montana, because we're shooting out at long range distance, but we have our instructors. So they're giving instruction to the students and they're also ranging it. When you go to the range here to shoot, it's really good, you've got somebody telling you high or low, but you need to hear them when you're communicating. So these hearing protections serves as like a microphone, as an amplifier. So when you're talking with one another and you need to hear something, it's, it turns it up like a microphone and you can hear it. But when the gun goes off, or even heavy equipment, we use it in our tractors and things like that at home, it, it shuts off so it serves as a protection. So this is just something that we use. We don't have them here tonight. We just have a special code. The company was so nice. and said, when you go and you speak, give this special deal to people that are at your seminars. So it's just something that we're just passing on to you as just a tip and something that might help you when you're out hunting. Yeah, there's samples here you can look at and then just scan the code and they drop ship them. The cool thing with those is they're like, Man, you guys are talking to a lot of people. They're doing them now two for $99. So that's a huge thing. And these over here, two for $199 or one for, I think, $124. So, so it's, it's great fun, deal. but it, it's great. They say, you know, do you, do you, well, how do you, you know, do all that together as a family? You just go try it. You know, our boys have been out hunting with us since they were just toddlers. And just make it fun. Sometimes they say, well, you know, I, if you have taken time off and you've worked hard and this is going to be a trophy hunt for you, I don't recommend taking somebody who's going for the first time or a youth out on that special day. Maybe do something when you're scouting and when you're going to look or when you're setting up or when you're doing your trail cams, but to make it fun for them. And always, always have a good snack bag. Good That's snack always. bag. Marsha packs important. the best That's snack always. bag. Thank you so much, honey. I appreciate it. Hunt in Montana, we do a lot of that, but we also have a long range shooting school that we run for Bergara, and we teach people how to shoot 1,400 yards. It's great. We've got uh, 
just an amazing range up there and it's a lot of fun. Marsha does all the cooking and, and uh, just great instructors and it's just a, a great time. All right, I know we have fishermen. We've got fishing rods up here on the deal. We gotta throw a little fishing in here, whether it's locally or halfway around the world, it's a great opportunity to get kids outdoors. And when you take kids fishing, realize this, sometimes they just wanna play in the minnow bucket. Sometimes they just wanna hang out, but make it fun for them while you're there. We have any fly fishermen in here tonight? Oh yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do. I guided over 30 years on the Missouri River up in Montana and I've taken my fly rod all over. I'm gonna share an adventure with you. I took my son down to Guyana, South America. And he said, how do you get there? You fly to Miami, fly to Guyana, then you get on a charter plane and you go out on a grass runway, you land. They don't have lawnmowers in the jungle. They have one weed eater. There is a person that weed eats, <laughs> runs a weed eater, a 1,500 feet runway. Can you imagine? <laughs> Just to keep it so that if there's a medical emergency or if people come in there fishing. Very few people get to fish down there, and there's lots of species. We're going after peacock bass and a few others. After you land, you go three hours by boat up this river to your grass huts that you stay in. There's black caiman crocs all over in that river. Walker's amazing on a fly rod. He's, he's fished everywhere from Argentina to the Arctic Circle, and that kid can cast. So we're out there and all of a sudden we start picking up these big old peacock bass. And you can do it on conventional tackle, that's fun, but we had our fly rods with us. And there's five different subspecies. They hit it just like your largemouth bass. You can see the paint's all gone on that lure. It's just, it's crazy. This will remind you of fishing bass coming out of the water. Woo, the pretty colors. Strip set. You say, what do you eat over there? There's no refrigeration, so you eat fish. You catch a few for lunch. There's piranha right there. You notice I didn't put my hand in that mouth. Piranha, wolf fish. And after fishing for these big old peacock bath, guy said, let's go after some river monsters. I'm like, river monsters? We go up river, he said, let's go after Arapaima. You take your boat, get it to the bank, take the motor off, and you pull it through the jungle. Look at this. This reminds me of some of the Tennessee boat ramps. So you get out there and look at the stuff we're going through. And yes, there are snakes and all kinds of stuff. Walker casts up. Very few people have caught arapaima on a fly rod and Walker hooked into one and it was a good fish. Look at that rod bending in half. That's a 10 foot, 12 weight rod. And this is a big fish. And I'm just sitting there going, Lord, let him catch this. Don't let it break off. And look at the tail, the piranhas chew on their tails. I mean, it's crazy, the type of stuff that's in that water. And I tell people, go on a fishing adventure, go on a hunting adventure at least once in your lifetime. It's very important. One of the biggest questions I get, how hard is it traveling with guns to these places you go? You just know the rules. Flying to Australia, sometimes that's a little more complicated. You gotta do your paperwork three to six months in advance in Africa. But in the US, you pretty much just show up at the airport, make sure your ammo is in a separate case, and make sure you have enough padlocks. We use the Sherlock gun cases, but you have padlocks for each place you can lock it. If you don't, the airlines 
they're not going to let you check that bag or TSA. So keep that in mind when you go, but flying with it is fun. Last year we went to Mozambique, and I've been to Africa several times, but I never experienced anything quite like this. We got into Mozambique and found out we were the first hunters that had been in that country in two years. The country had been shut down because of COVID. We got in there. Well, I didn't even think about in the villages. I know those people go out and they, they hunt, but they're snaring animals and they don't have the same, they don't have the guns that we do. They had not had that big influx of protein or meat in their villages. We went after Inyala. We were very fortunate to take a couple really nice Inyala. Then I got to hunt one of my favorite animals of all time to hunt, and that's Cape Buffalo. Now, are Cape Buffalo mean? Yeah, it's kind of like your mother-in-law joke. Cape Buffalo will stare you down like you own money. I mean, there aren't. So I was fortunate to take a big Cape Buffalo over there. I mean, they're huge, 2,000 pounds. But you know what was one of the most rewarding parts of this trip? It wasn't taking that big old buffalo. It's after, and they say, how do you get that down? You cut trails in there because you're not going to pack that animal out over there. We'd walked eight to nine miles to get on it. You cut trails in. They bring a Land Rover with a winch and pull it in. You take it back, you hang it, and then you go to the village. And this is what was so neat. You pull into the village, and these people on the bottom, they're excited. They had not seen this much meat in two years. You bring a 2,000 pound animal to a village of 150 people and people are lined up and they start cutting it. There's no refrigeration or freezers. They hang it. They're putting that up there. They dry it so it's like our beef jerky. They call it biltong. And what is so special is the people came up and were thanking us. They were translating to us and thanked us over and over again for donating their meat, that meat to their village. You know, as hunters, we can do some pretty incredible things, and that's one of the things we do. Our funds help conservation, but it also helps support these small villages over there. And uh, I'll just tell you, it was I, the little kids over there, and they were hauling water uh, from the well back to their grass huts. They were grinding their corn up, and then they were having some meat there. They were going to cook up fresh meat and then dry the rest. You say, do they utilize all the meat? You see that up there? Those are the hooves. They make stew out of it. I did not try that, I'm just telling you. But I will tell you, they utilize everything and it's very, very much a, just an amazing thing. And one more thing, we talked tonight about expecting the unexpected. You never know what's gonna happen as you're out there, as you're hunting. I put in for a lot of tags. We've gotta film 13 episodes every year and, and we're traveling all over. And You put in for licenses in different states because you can't, like Tennessee, you can buy a lot of stuff over the counter, but there are some special draws like your turkey draw that early season you guys did. So I put in for Iowa. Typically in Iowa, to hunt whitetails and rifle season, it takes four years to draw that tag. You build up your preference points. I was not expecting it. I drew my tag the first year. It was crazy I drew that tag. So I headed to Iowa. Now I'm ready to go take a big deer. There's big monster deer in Iowa. I'm in a great place. We're in the middle of cornfields and bean fields. It's going to be good. There should be about one to two feet of snow on the ground. It should be about five degrees. It should be really good. Guess what? We got there. It was 65 degrees. When Iowa whitetails are all bulked up, they got their winter coats on and it's 65 degrees in a full moon. Guess what? They don't move. They just stay bedded and they feed at night in the dark when it's cooler, and that makes sense. What did we do? We hunted, we hunted, we hunted. I know you're expecting a picture of a big deer next, right? That didn't happen. That happens all the time when people say, Chad, what, how long does it take to film a, a TV show? Well, it's 22 minutes. Sometimes we can get a show done in a day or two. Sometimes it's 10 days. You just never know. In Iowa? Sometimes you have that expense and you don't even get what you're after. Doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. But while we're there, the fourth night of the hunt, we're in this camp, 30 miles from a town, and all of a sudden we hear sirens. And I'm like, what is that? I mean, I'm on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden I hear sirens and this squad car comes flying by. I mean, we're, we're 400 yards off this little dirt road and I see it. And all of a sudden I hear sirens from another direction. I go inside and I 
tell the outfitter, I said, hey, there's sirens, something's going on. He goes, yeah, I just got a text, let's go. He's like, you know, first aid? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, we need to go. One of our hunters that was hunting got out of their stand and was heading back and there's been an accident. You see, I was expecting to see a trophy deer that night, but this is what we drove up on. The one truck was coming one way, they hit a intersection and they collided going 60 miles an hour. Young people were thrown from the vehicle. I will tell you this, thankfully there was no fatalities. But I will say what this person said. I never saw them coming. When those things happen, and I will tell you they are recovering, they're still recovering, and that was back in December. When those things happen, it makes you realize just how quick things can change. I was up in Michigan earlier this winter and I was telling this story and the chief of the fire department in this little town came up to me and said, hey Chad, I wanna tell you something, you're spot on. He said, we go to calls all the time and he said, I tell people this, three seconds can change your life. Whether it's a car accident, whether it's a heart attack, a stroke, something happened. three seconds can change your life forever. I was in Ohio this year and a, a guy came up to me and said, Chad, I'm a bus driver for a school bus. I went in, got my commercial physical, everything checked out. They said, I'm great. Next morning I get up, I drive the bus, came home, have lunch, take a little nap, get my bus to go pick the kids up. I black out, go off the road, crash the bus. He came up to me with a walker. He said, just a few months ago, he said, this happened. He said, they said I was in perfect health. He said, I had a stroke while I was driving. You don't know what's going to happen. You see, we plan and prepare for hunting season. We're out scouting turkeys. We're out doing all this stuff. But do you realize that you need to be prepared for eternity? You say, well, Chad, turkey season lasts four or five weeks. Eternity lasts a lot longer, doesn't it? Yeah, it lasts forever. So I want to ask you tonight, do you know 100% sure if something happens to you, you're going to heaven? You see, we don't know when something like that may happen, but we can be prepared. You say, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know. Well, here's the deal. For you whitetail hunters, you get up in that stand, you're sitting there, all of a sudden you've been sitting there 30 minutes, and you hear, snap. You're like, Squirrel? Then you're like, pick buck, pick buck. You're like, did I put one in the chamber? How many have ever checked your gun? You're sitting there. Oh, yeah. Why? Because you want to be prepared. You want to be prepared. The same thing for, for eternity when you take that last breath. Are you prepared? I say, well, how can you? Know? I'll just tell you, when I came into Knoxville, and came over here to Hall, I typed the church address in my GPS and I followed it because you have a lot of windy roads around here. I think Montana's in the middle of nowhere. You got a lot of windy roads. It's crazy. But I ended up here. You know, tonight you ended up here. You're here for a reason. I use the GPS to get here, but I tell people this is God's GPS. It will tell you how you can get to heaven, it'll show you the way. You see, I've guided a lot of hunters over the years. I've guided a lot of celebrities over the years. But tonight I'd like to guide you and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. You say, well, Chad, how can you know that? Well, first off, you have to realize you're a sinner. That's not too hard for us to figure out we're a sinner. In fact, the Bible says it in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. None of us are perfect. It goes on to say in Romans 3.23, for all, that's everybody, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, tonight somebody's going to win this bow they're giving away. And you're going to take it, take it down, get it set up. You might draw back, release that arrow. You got this. It's all on your own. And that arrow hits the dirt and hits the one rock that's in 20 yards of that target. And that arrow's going to go, poof. You came short. You tried to do it all on your own. You tried to make it hit that, but you didn't have it sighted. You didn't say, hey, can you help me, buddy? Can you look behind me, make sure I'm on that target? You see, there's a lot of people think, if I do good things, 
And if I do more good than bad, if my good outweighs my bad, I, I could go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. So you work all week. At the end of the week, you get a paycheck. That's your wages. That's what you deserve for what you worked. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So according to the Bible, it's not what you're doing, but it's what Jesus has already done for you. He's died on the cross for your sins. But there are still those people saying, oh, I, I got to do more good than bad. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, for by grace are ye saved, saved from what? Saved from an eternity in hell, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So according to the Bible, it's not all these things you're doing to get to heaven. It's one thing, it's accepting Christ. He's already paid the price. You see, you can't do it on your own. You need, you need Christ to have died on the cross, and you need to accept him. You say, well, Chad, who can go to heaven? Who can accept him? Romans 10, 13, for whosoever, that means for anybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. You say, well, how do I do that? Romans 10, 9. That if thou, that if you, shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So today, I want to ask you, do you know 100% sure? Not pretty sure, 100% sure. You say, well, I've heard that before. I figure I got lots of time. I can do it just at the last minute. I've been in car accidents like this, and when I talk to people that have been in those car accidents like that, you know what they say? Chad, I didn't have time to do anything. I never saw it coming, and it was over. I watched my grandfather when I was four years old have a massive heart attack in front of me. They tried to bring him back, and it was over. I knew he'd accepted Christ. He'd shared that with me. So I didn't have to tell him goodbye. I just had to tell him, see you later. You see, that's the greatest gift you can ever give someone. Let them know that you know. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, no one looking around. Now you say, Chad, I'm not prepared. I, I need to do that. I need to accept that gift. You know, I'd love to help you with that. Just quietly while you're sitting there, God knows your heart. Pray to him and accept him. You say, well, what do I say? Well, if you'd like to receive him while you're sitting there, just quietly pray to him and say something like this. Say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross and rose on the third day. Forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. Nobody looking around, head still bowed, eyes still closed. I'd like to pray for you. Tonight you say, Chad, I received that gift. I, I received that gift tonight. If you just lift up your hand so I can pray for you. Anybody in here? Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? Say, Chad, I received that gift tonight. Yeah, I'll do it one more time. You know, you bass fishermen out there, you cast that lure out, reeled in, boom fish hits and you miss but then every once in a while you get a second chance tonight you're getting a second chance don't let it be your last chance pray and accept him tonight dear Jesus I know I'm a sinner I believe you died on the cross rose on the third day forgive me of my sins and come into my heart thank you Jesus for dying on the cross coming into my heart. Anybody else I say, Chad, I just accepted that, that gift of salvation. Pray for me. Just lift up your hand. Yes, sir, I see your hand. Anybody else? Dear Lord, thank you for those that accepted you for tonight. That's the greatest thing they could ever do. That, receiving that gift of salvation, Lord, that's, that's the best thing. Lord, tonight they'll be able to put their head on their pillow and have a peace they've never, never felt before. Lord, thank you for this church up here. 
that cares about the community and wanted to do something to bring them into church. Lord, be with the rest of this meeting tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. You know, I just want to tell you, for those of you that accepted Christ, whether you raised your hand or not, that is the greatest gift you never received. You, you, you'll never, ever regret doing that. And I'll get to see you in heaven someday. You say, remember that night up in Tennessee? I tell you, if you did that, I want to encourage you to do this. At my table, there's a pamphlet. It's called Staring at Death. It's a story I wrote about being charged by a grizzly bear. It has all the verses that we talked about tonight. Swing by, get that. It has our email on it and our contact info. We want to pray for you. The other thing, maybe you have a friend or somebody you work with you want to share that story with. Pick up some of these. They're free. We'd be happy, happy to give those, those to you. Um, We'll be at the table tonight, and in a minute we're going to give you some cards uh, for the drawings, but I want to tell you, we'll be at the table tonight. We've got our buck knives, we've got a metal engraver, we uh, autograph them and we'll put your name on them, and uh, so we, we use these to help support our ministries. We travel across the country and uh, swing by. We also have uh, Marsh's cookbooks. These things are amazing. I'll tell you, like you know, it's a secret, there's wild game in it, but there's a bunch of other great recipes we use in our hunting camp. Page 112, double the topping. Oatmeal cake, it's amazing. I just talked to a guy the other day that got it. He's like, Chad, I told my wife that. She made one the next day. That is the best cake ever. It's, it's amazing. And then we've got a few of these left. These are our mammoth coolers. These for coffee, tea, or even uh, cold or hot. And uh, I tell people, pick one of these up. It has our logo on it. And pray for us uh, in the morning when you see that. that that's very very important. Um, appreciate you doing that. And then also, they're going to pass these cards out. And on these cards, they're going to fill them out. They're going to use these for the door prizes. It has your information on it. it. Has a box. I'd be interested in next year's event. I want more. I'd like more information on the church. And then if you accepted Christ tonight, make sure you check that box. We've got a record so we can pray for you and uh, make sure you fill those out. They're going to pass those out. Real quick, I think they have those ready, and uh, we're going to get those filled out real fast and uh, make sure uh, you get them filled out. Here we go. The pastor's got them right here. And we've and had a great... You've got a ticket when you came in the door. You give them a ticket, and they give you a card to fill out, okay? There's a pen right there in front of you in the seat, and so these are the cards we use to draw for the different items that we have. So they'll pass them out, you fill them out quick, and we'll, uh, we'll get this drawing taken care of. They had some great prizes, CVA Optimum muzzleloader and so much more stuff up here. So if you've got a ticket, give it to them. <clears throat> so if you don't have a ticket, then you won't receive a card. <clears throat> All right, fill those out quick, and we'll, uh, we'll get these door prizes. All right, one thing while, they're, while you're filling these out, I just want to encourage you. we got a lot of people that accepted Christ already in here tonight. I want to encourage you, be the best Christian you can be. There are people struggling all the time. And there's a lot of, what I, as I travel, I see a lot of young people out there that they're wanting to get involved in the outdoors and they may not have that father figure or someone that will take them. Find a neighbor, find a kid that you can get them started, get them influenced on uh, getting in the outdoors. And dads... Moms, when you get out there and you're out there fishing with them, turkey hunting, take your cell phones and turn them off. I go by lakes all the time and I see the parents sitting there on their phone where the kids' bobbers going up and down. It's okay. Turn it off. I know with some of your work, you have to have that. I get it. But don't be sitting there on social media when you can be out there with your kids and having real 
real face-to-face -face time with them. That's something I wanted to encourage you with. Uh, they've got a boot they're going to put all these prizes in, or draw them back, back to once draw. You get, once you get it filled out, it's going to just hold it up. They'll come by and collect it, and we'll get them all put in the you got, you got, she's talking about bringing plenty of snacks. We got snacks. Snacks in this bag. I suggest not eat this. Or the hand woman. Okay, just raise them up when she gets several things on the table to give away tonight. start tonight with a Hillander filet of Paula Knight. She's in tonight. Got the cheese with it. Start with that.
what we'll do next is we're going to give away this bow and arrow. Now, I'm going to give you a disclaimer with it. It's a brand new bow. Two right, two <laughs> He's deaf, so he don't know you can hear him. And uh, he can read my lips, so he don't know in a minute. <laughs> this is a rip stick and very nice bow. Um, and it was purchased from uh, Sportsman's Choice right here in Halls. And so he's agreed to set it up for free. If you're left-handed, you come in trade, he'll swap it even for you. He'll set it up for free, and it comes also with a $50 gift certificate that'll help buy the things to set it up because it's all right, and so it's a nice setup here. And so somebody's going to win this nice book. Got to mix them up good. All right, pick one out, just one. Okay. Nikki Muncy. Nikki Muncy, right here. got this, and we got this through, Chad helped us with this, and so we got this through there, and the folks that sponsor them, the muzzle loaders, and so we're going to do it, and last but not least, it's the same or different, okay, it's the same name, all right, need one more name for this one, come up here, all right, go ahead and grab one name, Colin Anders. All righty. Good job, guys. I appreciate it. So what we'll do, we're going to pray for the food in just a moment. And when you head through the doors, if you'll just keep walking, you'll run to the fellowship hall. It's all set up. And you can run down both sides of the table to get the food. The tables are set out there. There's another drink table. You go and get your drink. And uh, just enjoy yourself. I look forward to talking with some of you fellowshipping. And uh, we'll just pray. Mr. Chad does have a table set up in the foyer. You're welcome to stop by there and check it out. I encourage you to do that. And then, too, I'm going to have these. Rick, if you'll set these. We got these from Sportsman's Choice. They're uh, arrow grippers, and so arrow pullers, and so they're free. Get as many of those if you want. Now, the other stuff, he, his stuff's not free. 